Hiya, and welcome to another King's Daily. Good to be with you today, and um, we're warm welcome to you, by the way, if you're here for the first time. Yeah, great you can be with us. We're just working our way through the book of Acts at the minute, this book in the New Testament. It documents the first sort of 30 years or so of the expansion and growth of the early church, um, what Jesus continued to do. And um, the, Luke has already documented the um, Jesus' life in Luke's gospel, his what he taught, who he was, what he claimed, who he said he was, God with us, and, um, and that through his life and his death and his resurrection from the dead, our relationship with God is restored, that there's forgiveness for sin, there is a, um, the, the relationship that we're designed for, to know God, um, we can be brought back to God, we can come to him, we can walk with God now through life. Um, Luke so announces this good news, this incredible hope that goes beyond the grave, um, dealing with death, all these things that Luke talks about. And then into the book of Acts, he says, look, the disciples, you're going to go into the world and you're going to proclaim this gospel, this good news. And uh, you're going to go to the ends of the earth, to all nations. And disciples, I reckon, are pretty acutely aware of their inability to do this. Um, they, they've experienced themselves, their own maybe failures like Peter and... Um, who denied Jesus, who said, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, to your death. And even if the other disciples kind of mess up and if they're scaredy cats and they run away, I'm not going to. And then Peter denies Jesus three times and, and yeah, he gets wonderfully reinstated by Jesus, wonderfully restores him as, as Peter turns back to Christ after the resurrection. Um, but I wonder if they're very aware of their weaknesses, very aware of their their failures, very aware maybe of what Jesus said, that if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Um, and that it's not going to be easy. That Some of you will be flogged, some of you will be mocked and all the rest of it. And so I wonder what, how you would respond in that situation. And Jesus has come to them in chapter 1 and that Luke documents. He says, he said to his disciples, stay in Jerusalem, wait, because you need help. You need power that is beyond yourselves to do what I've called you to do. And so he says, wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. I'm going to empower you to do this. And so their first response, we're going to read in chapter 1, verse 12. I don't know how you'd respond in that situation. But it says this in chapter 1, verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. And they all joined constantly together in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers as well. And I love that. That's their first response, is to pray. They joined constantly together in prayer. It wasn't to strategize, wasn't to come up with a clever five-point plan of world domination and how to start a religion. It was to pray. It was to cry out to God. They'd seen Jesus doing it through his life. Jesus had taught them to pray, aware maybe, like I've said, of their own failures and inabilities and what was ahead and maybe the difficulty of the situation that they were going to be walking into and the challenges that they were going to face. They needed God. And so they prayed, they joined together in prayer. And of course, through this season, it's not easy necessarily to be praying with other people. Um, but thankfully, we've got technology. We can use Zoom for prayer meetings in church and so on. Um, and life groups are praying together. Maybe, um, maybe a phone call. We can pray over the phone. We can pray over a FaceTime. We can pray in a garden socially distanced or now maybe in a house socially distanced with maybe one other or something like that. But I just want to encourage us to keep finding ways to pray together. Um, it's great to pray on your own. But I don't know about you, I find it really helpful praying with others. And I've learned a lot from praying with others as well. And the other thing it says here, they joined constantly together in prayer. Um, there was consistency to this. It wasn't just a kind of one-off thing. It was a recognition that they need God and, and prayer, an expression of our dependence on God. It's not a religious exercise. It's not us trying to win points with God or score points with God. It's a relational deal. That's why Jesus taught pray when you pray. Pray our Father um, in heaven, that we, that, that we pray from that place, that we get to pray, and we need to pray. We, we recognize our need, and so we call out to God consistently. And it doesn't mean that we're just literally like verbalizing all day, but it's just having that disposition in our hearts to go, do you know what, I need God in this situation. 
Let it be our first resort, as it was with the disciples, not our last resource. Our first resource, rather, not our last resort. That we, we turn to God in prayer. There's a great quote, I love a good quote, um, in this book by um, Gerald Sitzer called um, Water from a Deep Well, one of my favourite books. And he starts off actually in the book of Acts in this book and then he goes through beyond Acts into church history asking what can we learn from different periods in church history and different people. And he talks about prayer here and he says this, Our best prayers therefore are simply extended conversations with God about life as we live it from day to day in all of its sublime ordinariness. The routine of life presents us with a grand opportunity to learn how to pray. The world a laboratory to teach us to pray. There's nothing magical about petitionary prayer. It involves little more than inviting God to become active in our lives. We can all do that, can't we? We can all invite God to become active in our lives. If we took a few moments to ponder the weightiness of what happens in a normal day, we'd be overwhelmed with a deep sense of helplessness and vulnerability. We would cry out to God in our utter desperation. How could any of us think to raise our children, build a good marriage, do our work with energy and integrity, survive a crisis, or care for a needy neighbour to say nothing of solve world problems without God's help? We need God whether or not we feel it. We long to know God whether or not we are aware of it. Good book. And if you're struggling to pray and learn how to pray, I'd encourage you to um, maybe get hold of it. It's a Praying Life, a bit of a book recommendation today, but Praying Life by, um, by Paul Miller. This is a brilliant book. I know a number of people at King's would have read this already, but he's a great tour guide, great encouragement. It's a book on prayer that really leaves you wanting to pray as well. So I encourage you to have a look at that if you're looking for some help uh, to learn how to pray. I just want to end, though, by... Uh, reading a prayer. I love them. Uh, I've mentioned this in other settings, Paul's kind of pithy prayers in 2 Thessalonians. I just want to pray this as we end today um, and encourage us to be those that, 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 that pursue prayer, that keep seeking to grow in it, keep seeking to learn in it, keep seeking to pray together uh, as a church. And it says this, 2 Thessalonians uh, 2 verse 16, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. May God encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good word and deed. Amen. Good to be with you. Hope it's been helpful. Take care. Bye.